think it's just fridges. That's just how it's fridges just, sound? Most people don't record next to them. <gasps> True. That's the this thing. is why we need to win $60 million so that we can have a podcasting room that's like in the basement and all like shrouded with fabric so that it sounds really good. Really? We could just use the office and put up stuff, but that's... Maybe we should look into it. Maybe. Ah, well. <laughs> Welcome everyone to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too. My name is India Randawa, and with me is my beautiful and talented co-host, Miss Samantha He. You're so nice to me in the intro, I love it. <laughs> the rest of the time, though, we are fighting. No. Oh. You've been watching too much Fiance. 90 Day Fiance? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had to drag ourselves away from 90 Day Fiance to come record this. True. It is a painfully addictive show. Yeah. Sometimes I, I really like it. Sometimes I really hate it. <laughs> and sometimes we are rationally angry at things that happen. <laughs> um, how are you today, Andy? I'm pretty good. It's definitely a change of season day for us today. It's like a drastic change of season day today. Yeah, winter is coming, or fall at least, is coming. Summer really seemed over today, but... We're in Edmonton, so who knows how warm or cold it will be tomorrow. But we're recording this a couple of weeks in advance, so when it comes out, it might be 20 below, might be 20 above. It could go either way. Who knows? I know that in three days it's supposed to be like 26 degrees. So I just like had this taste of fall this weekend, and now I'm like, yeah, I want to get my sweaters out, and I want to wear like boots and tights and everything. And then, of course, we have three days of that, and then it's going to be back to being above 20 and like hot and i had my first taste of fall because i thanks to the tutelage of one miss samantha he's had my first pumpkin spice latte yeah we're gonna get you fitted for your ugg boots next and then i'm gonna buy some music at starbucks yeah. i'm gonna put up my live laugh learn love live love laugh learn what are the things that they say on pillows all the time live love laugh learn i think I thought there was only three, but either way, I'm going to get a bunch of those. I'm going to probably get some pillows that have a, a compass on it, but not like a real cool compass, like one of those kind of sketched ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, You could wear an oversized scarf. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm into that, actually. I do like big scarves. <laughs> but anyways, uh, pumpkin spice latte, not a fan. Not a fan. No. Okay, well, I think that's okay, and I think our relationship will survive. You do love them, though. I do. Huh. Half sweet extra shot pumpkin spice latte is like my jam. See, I love pumpkin spicy things. I like pumpkin pie. I like that scent a lot. Yeah. And I've grown to love coffee quite recently. I don't think those two tastes work. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I just love how like spicy it is and delicious. Well, then I'll just have some cha. Yeah, you're right. Pumpkin spice cha. I'd be all over it. <gasps> pumpkin spice teas, I think, would work better. You can buy like the pumpkin spice syrup and we could put that in cha. There you go. I bet that's already a thing there, but they'll call it like a pumpkin spice masala chai tea latte venti quadrophenia. What? I don't know. I don't understand. How <laughs> what happened at the end there? <laughs> he looked panicked and just started saying words. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when I order at Starbucks as well. That's why I ordered this weekend. I've ordered at Starbucks maybe two, three times in my life without you and it doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> you just tell me what you want and like what kind of experience you want yeah. and then i'll order you a drink yeah i always just say like i want something really strong but a little sweet as well and then you take it from and then there. i'm like okay done one of the times was in russia and i was just as able to order there as i am here <laughs> because i was like oh man i don't know what they have here cappuccino is the same in every language and that's how i feel in edmonton yeah as well. i usually try to give you like two options because also part of going to Starbucks a lot is they don't always have their full menu up on the board. It's usually whatever their features are. So there's like a whole list of drinks that you just kind of know by going. Like they don't list all of the lattes and like the frozen drinks and everything. Sometimes if you it's just fall, have to know to know. it's like here's three pumpkin drinks and then everything else that's usually on the menu is still on the menu. This is too much for me already. <laughs> you have to have like a long history with starbucks to be able to feel confident in ordering i think hey remember how this is a podcast about movies and stuff it, not just our private couple conversations <laughs> rehashing i bet our... there are several starbucks 
podcasts. Oh, I'm there. sure. And I bet I hate them. I bet you do hate them. <laughs> Knowing you, you would. Who you would. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> You just get so grumpy when when I tell you all the things about Starbucks. I just don't see why it's bigger than itself. Mm-hmm. Like if you're like, oh, I love this thing there and I drink it and it tastes good. That's fine. But when people are excited for like, oh, it's this season at Starbucks. Oh, they've changed their color palette. And I don't like when companies are worshipped for being companies. <laughs> like I don't have uh, like an NBC t-shirt. I like 30 Rock, but I don't cheer on the corporation, I guess. Yeah. I like the products of corporations because I can't avoid them, but I don't like to cheer for corporations. I don't like wearing a shirt that just says, like, Pfizer, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. Lockheed Martin. I get it. Westinghouse. I just don't like them. What have they done for me? What has Starbucks done for me? Caffeinates me real good so I don't murder you. Whoa. (laughs) Well, thank you, Starbucks. I owe my life to you. <laughs> Remember how we were getting off Starbucks? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so how this podcast works, if somehow this is your first episode and you got this far, wow, you have a lot of patience. Good it job. only gets better from here. It does. Uh, we take turns bringing a movie to the other person. I am going to be the choosing the movie for Samantha to watch next week. We'll get to that soon. But before we do that, we're going to talk about our things of the week. Something (laughs) we like that we've been into lately before we get into the big episode of next week. I was excited. So, Indy, now that you've given that really good explanation of what our podcast is about and that it isn't about Starbucks, what's your thing of the week? My thing of the week is the television show The Venture Brothers. Oh. So The Venture Brothers is a cartoon It started, I think, in 2003. They have had 81 episodes over seven seasons. And it's not something that has been coming out every year. I think it was only like that for the first two or three seasons. And since then, there's been gaps of about three years between seasons. So it's not a terribly regular one. And it's a show that I'd forgotten how much I loved. But recently, I started rewatching it. I'm currently... At the beginning of season five of a rewatch, I actually haven't seen the seventh season, so I'm really excited to get to that. But it is a play on kind of those 60s and 70s adventure cartoons into the 80s as well. Do you know kind of what I mean? Yes. Would Scooby-Doo be one of these? Scooby-Doo is a little bit of an offshoot, but yeah, I think that works in here too. And actually, Scooby-Doo gets referenced in this show a little bit as well. Oh, okay. I, that's kind of the only like adventure cartoon that I know of. There were a few that were much more into like the, the world travel almost. Mm-hmm. They would often have a boy who would be going with his maybe father, maybe caretaker, bodyguard, something like that. They're going around the world. They're solving mysteries. They're... There's a lot of adventures, so it was more like cursed mummy tombs rather than haunted houses like Scooby-Doo, oh. and it was all often in different countries. They would have usually racist portrayals of people in all these different places. So it's a really fun subgenre, but this is a cartoon that takes place in that world, except it takes place today. So all of those people have lived that life in the 60s or 70s or 80s but now they're existing in our world today oh okay everyone has kind of grown into our modern world except for the titular venture brothers they still really seem like they're in 1965 the way they dress the way they talk and act Hmm. Uh, there are a couple of 16 year old boys Their father was an adventurer who has turned into a super scientist but now he's just very jaded and scarred from everything that he had seen adventuring around the world with his father and we learned that his father was like all abusive and all sorts of things like that so that's part of that taking this funny cartoon idea that they had way back then but bringing it into our modern world and how people who have existed in both worlds like don't always seem at odds with everything okay you get some characters that are based on, like, Johnny Quest. That was a, a famous cartoon, mm-hmm. but now he is a heroin addict. Oh, um, <laughs> time's like a turn. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fun <laughs> bit of, uh, like, the cartoon world interacting with our modern reality, and they can't, like, 
reconcile the two so then they often turn to something like that oh okay but that premise alone is, is funny but i don't think it could sustain an entire show like you know like, okay i get the satire that of these cartoon characters dealing with modern problems is funny but like can that keep going and what makes this show better than a lot of uh satirical comedies especially cartoons is that they keep developing it over time Mm -hmm. so each season it's just evolving more and more like at the end of season one there's a really tragic reveal and that colors all of season two and then in season three we start learning about the backstories of all these characters through flashbacks right so you have all these cartoonish supervillains. like one is calls himself the monarch and he says he was raised by butterflies and he flies around in a giant cocoon and he dresses like a butterfly okay so it's silly and over the top but then we get to see the backstory of where they come from and it's almost like it's heartbreaking and sad but then it's mixed in it's mostly a funny show huh so for instance there's these two characters who we don't really know why they're like this or who they are but they seem to be kind of best friends but they argue a lot and then we get to see this whole backstory and we find out like why this kid lost an eye that he was put into a dog fighting match because they were so broke and they needed the money and they were disgraced and on the road and you get to see all of this and you're like oh my god this is terrible but then you come back to today where they're just like this couple of bickering like middle-aged men now but you get to see all the tragedy behind things oh there's all these countless henchmen like you would have in any comic book or cartoon like this and they're all faceless but every now and then we'll focus on one and we get to see what's going on in their life like for instance when one of the main bad guys goes to prison all of his henchmen are like out of work so they have to move in with their dad again and (laughs) get a job at a comic book store And then one henchman, his best henchman friend dies and he just can't get over the death. So for, I think, maybe like two years, the ghost is always with him, but you're never sure if it's a ghost or it's probably just him like trying to cope with things. But this is really sad. It is, but it never really seems (laughs) sad. And I think I say this a lot with many things that I'm talking about, especially with TV shows, like when we're talking about community That it has all of this humor on the front. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely the case here. It's a really funny, silly show. You can not follow the big plot line and just watch episodes here and there. And it's funny and it's silly and you're gonna gonna have a good time watching it. But there's this underlying sweetness. Mm. And it's a really tough balance to strike. And I think this show does it very well. A long time ago, the creators and there's really like two guys behind it named jackson public and doc hammer both are not their real names but it seems like it's a really small group of people that made this because the credits are always super short and it's the same names multiple times right but uh the creators were saying that this show is all about failure even in the design Everything is supposed to be kind of the death of the space age dream world, the death of all those jet age promises. It's about the beauty of failure. Every character is not only flawed, but sucks at what they do and is beautiful at it. And we, meaning the creators, suck at what we do (laughs) and we try to be as beautiful at it. It shows that failure is funny, it's beautiful, and it's life, and it's okay. Hmm. And I really like that. And I think they... uh, they feel like that simplifies things too much, but I think that encapsulates a lot what the show's about. Okay. It sounds like it's a very, like, varied and multidimensional show. I think it is. And I think because of how I'm talking about it, it probably sounds much more serious than it is. It probably mm-hmm. sounds closer to a BoJack Horseman, which this show is not. This show is closer to a superhero show with a lot of gags in it than, <laughs> than like, the brutal reality of BoJack. Oh. But... While that show, BoJack Horseman, had occasional glimpses of silly, cartoonish behavior, Mm -hmm. this show is mostly silly, cartoonish behavior with those occasional glimpses of brutal reality. But when they come through there, I don't know, it's it's beautiful. I really like it. I think the show is a lot funnier and more clever than I realized it Mm -hmm. was. So I'm really enjoying this rewatch. And today I just pulled up Uh, wikipedia to get the dates and things for the show to see when it first started how many episodes and all that and i learned as of the date we're recording this one hour ago 
they announced it has been canceled. Aww. I had seen that they were working on a season eight and they were writing it, but apparently during that time, the show has now been canceled. So season seven is the last one. They did write much of season eight, so who knows? Maybe in a long time, we'll get some more. Um, I heard that this show has a record for being the longest continuously running show with the fewest episodes. Huh. Because it's been going for like 15 years. But they only release every so often. Yeah, because it's been three years between seasons. Right. So hopefully there'll be some more at some point, but it looks like that's it. So go check out The Venture Brothers wherever you can find it. That's my thing of the week. Thing of the week. And how about you, Samantha? What's your thing of the week? Um, My thing of the week, uh, since I went back to work, because I was lucky enough to be able to get a new job during a pandemic and I get my commute back, which is really nice. Um, and uh, so I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks. And one of the audiobooks I listened to um, was called You. And if you recognize that title, it's because there was a 2018 Netflix series called You. Which we talked about very early in this show, I believe. Which we did, yeah. So I watched the Netflix series and kind of had it in the back of my brain that there was a book that I probably should check out um, and never did. And then it came up on um, the library app for our public library and uh what's the library app we can i feel like things like that we can plug because it's a a library app that gives you free access to books and audiobooks i believe it was libby yeah libby by overdrive so overdrive is the company check into it wherever in the world you are at your public library they probably have some sort of system like this Mm -hmm. where you don't even have to go to the library if you don't want to and you can download audiobooks and uh ebooks for free from your own phone or computer it totally is such a great app and i really like it because once you start using it i feel like it starts to find things that you might like too so when you go to available audiobooks it it kind of brings up stuff that's interesting and it kind of gets rid of some of the things that you might not find interesting and things that you don't pick so i um stumbled upon this um when i went into the available audiobooks and i started listening to it right away and i think i finished it in about 48 hours is it a long one short read listen um, It felt very short, and it was one of those ones that was very, like, gripping and kind of made me want to put my headphones on as much as I could. Um, So I think I spent a couple lunch hours just, like, walking outside and listening to the book and, like, trying to find time to listen to it because it was very engaging, and um, it's different from the show in that I would say it's more, like, adult. I think because Netflix is kind of accessible to everybody they can't have quite the adult content that you know some shows that are on at like only at midnight or 11 p.m would have um because there's less likely to be young people watching it and kind of consuming that content so um this book is definitely um a little more graphic a little bit more adult and uh i found it really creepy And I loved it. Like, it worked so well, just with the level of creepiness. For those of us who aren't familiar with the show, could you give us a bit of a synopsis without getting into any spoilers? Yeah, so it's uh, about a man um, named Joe. And he, it's kind of a thriller novel, so it's through his eyes completely. And um, he basically stalks and gaslights and like creates this relationship with this girl so that he is her perfect man so by stalking her before he actually meets her he gets the exact sense of what she wants in a guy and what kinds of things are going to make her like respond really well to him and what kinds of things um are gonna absolutely ensure that she dates him and falls in love with him and stuff so you kind of see this and then there's twists and turns and there's people in her life who kind of get in his way and I won't give any more away but it's very much um it's very interesting to see this from his point of view because he's clearly very mentally ill and the you can tell that in the beginning of the book but uh you get to see how he kind of problem solves from this perspective and does uh, sometimes his problem solving is murder so <laughs> it's not very good problem solving but he um you definitely get to see how his brain works in this like weird stalker obsession kind of fantasy world that he lives in 
I do often enjoy when things force us to identify with uh, what we would normally consider as a villain character. Mm-hmm. And it's so much more effective, I think, in novels than it can be in film. Mm-hmm. Because you can have the narration of your American psychos and things like that, but it can't get you right into the mind of someone like the novel version of it yeah. can. And from what you're saying to me, uh, that's kind of the closest parallel I could find is the mm-hmm. American Psycho movie and novel. Because it seems like in both cases, you're dealing with someone who is psychopathic or something along those lines Uh, yeah i'm not 100 percent sure what that would be but it's definitely and through having their narration you kind of are forced to go along with their way of thinking Mm -hmm. and see the inner workings and the bizarre psychology that goes on there yeah is that fair to say absolutely and i think in the netflix show you get both perspectives a little bit more whereas with this book and part of what made it so creepy was that like you said you do find yourself almost on the side of the person doing all these really bad things and because it was an audiobook it felt very much like it was in your head and it was very like it was really cool because i've read books like this where you like sit and read a physical book which i feel like i'm really bad at now that audiobooks have come into my life (laughs) and podcasts um but yeah no i think that having the narrator speak directly into your ears and like you start to feel kind of the emotions and the excitement and everything from this book. And it's like audiobook is like the perfect medium for this, I think. Yeah. A lot of those ones where they're almost speaking directly into your brain kind of audiobooks work well for them. So could you tell us the name and author again? Yeah. So it's called You by Carolyn Kepnes. And she also released a sequel called Hidden Bodies, which I haven't listened to, but I think it's probably pretty close to season two of You on Netflix, which I have seen. But I just reserved it and actually downloaded it while I was looking at the information for this novel to tell you guys about. So if you listen to it and you love it, tell me what you think, because I'm probably going to start it this week. All right. So does season one kind of correspond to the first novel? Pretty much exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Do you know if there's plans for a third season or a third book? I'm not sure. Um, I bet we can look that up and I bet. We'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised <laughs> Surprised to find out that there's more for you to watch and yeah, listen to. Yeah, Hidden Bodies came out in 2016, so maybe there's something coming, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think... Uh, I think it'll be really good if it is, but... I bet that Netflix money will kind of entice the author to do another book. I bet. I bet. There was two years or so between the first two books, so maybe she thought she was done and then she got some Netflix money and now she's going to milk it for all it's worth and write more books. We'll see. And hopefully it doesn't suck because sometimes when that happens, they start to get very, like, cliche and boring. Very true. So... But yeah, so You by Carolyn Kepnes, followed by Hidden Bodies. Um, And then when you read those books, then you can watch the Netflix series. So it's like almost like four things in one. There you go. That's a quadruple pick of the week from Samantha. Yeah. So Indy, the reason that we are all here, the reason that we continue to listen to this show, what are we watching this week? All right. For our next week... I really had a tough time picking what to do next, not because of any shortage of things. I actually have a huge list that I am choosing from, and I kept thinking, like, well, I haven't done any Scorsese yet, so maybe I should do that. Mm -hmm. It's been a year since I did a Miyazaki or a Kubrick, so that's always a good option, too. And especially now, since all those Miyazaki ones are on Netflix. Yeah. People are really into them again, which is great. I'm not taking anything away from those. But I went off the board. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to pick something that I saw once I thought was great. And taking a step away from Indy's film class like we had (laughs) last time with Psycho. Something where we're not going to talk about any history. We probably won't talk much about formal stuff. We're just going to be talking like, oh, how'd you feel? What'd you think? Oh, it's a feelings movie. It's a feelings movie, (laughs) I think. Okay. We are watching the 2006 animated feature, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. Okay, I know nothing about this. And I think a good portion of our audience won't know either. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is directed by Mamoru Hosoda. He Mm -hmm. is a Japanese director, and 
He started out working with Studio Ghibli. He actually was going to be the director of Howl's Moving Castle at first, which we will get there at some point. Okay. You're looking at me very puzzled. I'm like, I don't know what that is. I know you like named a whole bunch of Studio Ghibli movies in the car today. It's a Miyazaki one, but originally it wasn't going to be him directing. He was writing, but kind of stepping away from directing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this man, Hosada, was brought in to direct. He had done television. He did like Digimon stuff and uh, Samurai Champloo, which if any of you have seen that, that's very good as well. But he was brought in for that one, but they kept giving him notes. And the note was always, well, make it more like Miyazaki would. And he wouldn't do it. So he left. He left Studio Ghibli. Like, that would be, like, um, an animator in the U.S. getting to direct Moana and being like, you know what? No thanks. I'm going to go make my own stuff. Yeah. Which is insane. That's crazy. It's like leaving Disney. Yeah. That would be huge. But he went on, and he went to a studio called Madhouse, where he did The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, which may be his directorial feature debut. Oh, no. There was... Digimon stuff oh. like that but uh this one at the time when it came out it wasn't a big deal it was released in a few theaters here and there but at all the showings they just started getting more and more popular and it'd be sold out all the time even though it was kind of a, a small little movie mm -hmm. uh, there's all these stories about them selling out so they're selling standing room tickets so people could see this movie standing room tickets in a movie theater? yeah but this because it's only playing at a couple of theaters uh. And it got really popular. So then it got a wider release and it actually got nominated and won lots of uh, prizes in Japan. Oh, cool. Didn't really get much recognition over here. But he then went on to do a movie called Summer Wars, which is quite good. He did Wolf Children, which we will absolutely do on this podcast because Wolf Children is so good as well. The Boy and the Beast. And there's a new one or new wish because it's two years ago, called Mirai. Mirai? I'm not sure about that one. Okay. That's the only one I haven't seen, and I actually didn't know he had a newer movie, so hmm. I might be doing that tonight when you go to bed. <laughs> Indy and I have drastically different sleep schedules, except for like three times a week. Yeah. Every now and then we overlap. <laughs> he'll ov He'll often just stay up and watch movies, or get up really early and watch movies. Yeah. It's movie time. Movie time for Indy. Well, let's look at a little trailer for it. I feel like it gives away some things, but the things it gives away also happen in the first little while of mm, the film. So okay. it's not giving away too much, but it'll at least give us a place to start talking about it a little. You're probably thinking that this can't be happening, but I'm going to die. This is my last day. It's about time you got up. I thought today... It was supposed to be a nice day. Hmm? <gasps> <laughs> Come on, it's not that it's hilarious. What you experienced, it happens to a lot of girls around your age. No way, trust me, it never happens. <laughs> Come on, this changes everything. I can go back and forth any way I like. I can sleep in after the alarm goes off. Yes. If I forget something, I don't have to go back to get it. <laughs> Ever think that someone might be suffering from your good fortune? Huh? Nobody's suffering. I mean, I can always go back and do things over as many times as I want. Who knows? If I knew this was going to happen, I would have gotten up earlier. I wouldn't have slept in, and I wouldn't have been late. I would have fried that tempura better, and that stupid boy at school wouldn't have been thrown into me. But I'm going to die. This is my last day. All right, what do you think? I think it looks really good. I already, I'm kind of excited to watch it. What does it look like to you? What's appealing about it? It looks like a time travel movie, but it's got, um, like, not your usual time traveling people in it. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Like, usually time travelers are, like, serious guys and, like, or it's magic or, like, like it, it, this seems very kind of off the beaten path of time traveling movies. 
that's absolutely true. I think I think of it as kind of the opposite but the same because there's this specific type of movie I love that only seems to exist in Japan. Mm -hmm. There are these quiet coming of age stories. They're usually teenage girls and it's nothing drastic happens but people just just grow up a little. Hmm. It's not a life-changing event but it's just people learning to deal with one part of growing up. It's just one step towards adulthood. There are movies like Five Centimeters Per Second, A uh, Whisper of the Heart. A Whisper of the Heart is currently on Netflix. I definitely recommend oh. that for anyone out there. And even a uh, Totoro, which is a very different type of movie, it has a little bit of that too. I was talking about how the older sister and helping her little sister, were, there's just something really, really special and yeah, beautiful that I we don't that. often get to see in a lot of movies here. And if we were to have a movie like that here, it wouldn't be a cartoon and there would have to be a much bigger life event. Like someone would have to die. There would have to be a big mm -hmm. relationship and breakup and things like that. These ones allow for some of the stillness and the impatience of wanting to grow up. Hmm. But if you want to grow up, it just doesn't work like that. You have to have a little bit of patience. And that's what these movies almost force upon you because everything is rather slow and small and subtle. And I bet there is a name for this type of film in Japanese that I don't know about. But The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is that foremost, and then the time travel is like a fun little add-on. Oh, okay. So I definitely think it's much more of a coming-of-age story than it is a time travel movie. Mm -hmm. It's funny to say that this movie has time travel in it, but that's not the key element. Yeah, that's funny because usually it's like a time traveling movie, right? Mm -hmm. like, like, what's that one? Jumper? Looper? Looper is a movie and Jumper is a movie, but I think you're thinking of Looper. Okay, where like that is literally the whole movie. There is yes. no backstory. There is no other things going on. It's just literally some douchey dude jumping through time. Well, it's not some douchey dude. It's uh, Jogo, <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He's little... I love that guy. Oh, okay. I think he's I I'm think he's sorry. a nice boy. I apologize to Jogo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a good example because movies like that tend to be hard, cold, scientific, often really smart and really clever, mm. but not the most heartfelt. Yeah, and this seems like it has a lot of passion and like yes. love in it. This is a much softer movie. It's They're a nice movie. Just nice. I think that's the worst word to describe things, <laughs> but the best word to describe this like subgenre of movie. They're very nice movies. Oh, okay. They might be sad in the end. They might be happy in the end, but it's small and it'll make you think a little bit. Okay. Also, for some reason, I seem to have like a bit of nostalgia towards Japan. I've only spent probably less than two months of my life there altogether, but Japanese films make me miss the country a lot more so than a like a movie that takes place in LA or New York or London like I've been there but I don't miss it when I watch a movie right these ones make me miss Japan and I think they're really good at showing exactly what life is like there more than a movie in Japan mm -hmm. like if I watched a, a crime thriller that's live action that takes place in Tokyo I don't really feel anything for that but I think with these cartoons, and that's yeah. that's what they are, because they're so painstakingly crafted in how it looks and how everything is put together because they're they're drawing all of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's almost a built-in emotion. So the visuals here are able to capture what Japan looks like, but also what Japan feels like, hmm. which is something you can't do from just a... a a photograph oh, right i'd argue you can because i'm a photographer <laughs> <laughs> i can't do well like i can't do it as well as they are doing it in this movie there's like a real ability to sustain this quiet summer day okay yeah i could i could kind of see that and it's also, I don't think it takes place in a big city. If it does, there's all these scenes of them walking through the countryside. And mm -hmm. the Japanese countryside, I just can't see enough cartoons that take place there. They look, it looks like beautiful. Like in Totoro. Like in Totoro. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I totally get that. Well, I'm really excited to watch this movie. Yeah. So 
It's called The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. There's also a live action movie that is sometimes titled the same way. It's not that one. This is the one from 2006. It's animated. It's available to rent on YouTube, on Amazon, or on if you're a Funimation subscriber, you'll get it for free. But also, if you're a Funimation subscriber, you've seen The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like that's pretty obscure. And if you have that, you should probably have already seen it. It's not as obscure as we think. I think there's a lot of really big anime fans, but they tend to be, at least in Canada, we get more who are interested in the, the fantasy elements of anime rather right. than these kind of coming of age stories, which hmm. is my favorite little subgenre. Okay. So go check it out. Find it somewhere. Get it at your public library. I know ours has it. Uh, if you know me, ask me. I'll get it to you yeah. as well. Just email me and you can uh, watch The Girl Who Left Through Time. Okay. Well, we're going to go watch that probably tomorrow. And we will see you next Monday when we talk about The Girl Who Left Through Time and how good slash bad it was. Good. It'll just be good. Double good. Okay. <laughs> good slash good. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone.